This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hey, and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Catherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And today I'm going to talk about um, the electric vehicles. And actually, they're a shock to the system. I've talked about EVs a little bit earlier in an earlier broadcast, but that was sort of just explaining how the EVs are made and things. Now I'm actually going to be talking about some of the pushback that people are getting, both here in the United States and also abroad, about whether or not EVs really are the right choice for transportation on as we do this race towards electrification. But first, I have to start with some of my most favorite part of the episodes is always this breaking news, also known as you can't make this stuff up. And you're not going to believe this. But polluting planes and ships are now considered green renewable energy, according to the um, electric union, the European Union. The planes and ships that run on fossil fuels will be given a green investment status, uh, the EU Commission announced, um, because apparently they don't have any alternatives. And so they have to say, well, we know that the ships and planes use fossil fuels, but we're going to let it pass because, frankly, we need it. Millions of euros could then therefore be channeled towards some of European's largest polluters, like Airbus, Ryanair, and MSMSC. So investments with, in more, quote, efficient planes will now be considered green, whether or not they still run on fossil fuels. Which leads the Transport and Environment Minister to sort of say, uh, the inclusion of polluting planes and ships is the nail in the coffin of the co- EU's taxonomy. Now, taxonomy is what they've been using to rate different fuel choices and sort of, you know, kind of do a, you know, is this really green or should it, this be more green or whatever. It's how they classify different courses of fuels, including hydrogen. But if the planes are in oil, are running on oil and ships running on gas are considered sustainable, then there's a huge, then there's, there's little hope for the taxonomy. Europe's lawmakers must vote down this measure and save what's left of it. So here you have the transportation environment minister, shipping director, saying that this is going to be a nail in the coffin, while you have European governments realizing that there is no safe alternatives yet for completely green ships and planes. So we're going to give them a pass. I told you you can't make this stuff up. And then the other really favorite, one of my other really favorite stories this week is so funny. Um, so in Chechnya, which used to be part of Czechoslovakia and now is the Czech Republic, actually has a lot of solar PV um, sta- uh, plants, uh, solar PV systems, because, of course, they're trying to reduce their reliance on your, on the Russian gas, right? It's, it's, it seems like a good idea. Well, apparently not, because they actually had to turn off hundreds of solar plants Due to sunny weather. It was too sunny. They didn't have the battery storage there. So the sunny weather has forced the Chechen state-owned government, uh, state-owned company to disconnect hundreds of solar power plants from the grid for the first time. You know why? They were worried they'd burn out the grid. Plants were shut down remotely during the Easter holiday, but the solar plants produced so much energy, it was a situation that created a massive surplus of energy on on the grid threatening it so they decided to activate the containment plan after exhausting all the other sources and the funniest thing was they couldn't even sell the excess solar to other neighboring state countries because they had similar problems so they tried to sell it to say slovakia Denmark, denmark Portugal were also had too much solar, so there was no way to get off, get rid of this excess electricity on this on the grid. So they had to have it shut down. Europe warned, experts warned that such situations could occur in the future too, more often because the solar boom is happening, and and because they're trying to obviously reduce their reliance on Russian oil. So clearly, when the sun shines, they can have a lot of solar power. Unfortunately, it's too much for the current grid to handle. And since we haven't really figured out battery storage options um, to, to capture this energy for later, they're just going to have to shut it off. Something tells me they haven't really thought out, well thought out, the transmission distribution and 
and generation part of this new renewable energy market that we're getting ourselves into. If we have to shut off hundred, if check, just, they have to shut off hundreds of solar power plants because it's too sunny. I mean, what is the point of this? I mean, it, it, it just shows you again that there's all these well thought, I mean, well, well intended, but not so well thought out. Um, solutions that people are coming up with. It's uh, it's amusing to me as always. But um, and then, you know, flipping the coin and going on the other extreme, Europe, Germany just cut off its last remaining nuclear power plant, one that they could actually control because they've had this mission to get rid of nuclear power for the last 20 years. And the exit decision comes with the anti-nuclear lobby pushing really hard. So three lo- the final three plants were shut down. And that provided only 6% of Germans' energy last year. And meanwhile, um, they're they're getting a lot of energy from renewables, 46%. um, But they're still going to rely on coal now instead of nuclear. The coal is still going to count for over 30% of their energy production um, because they don't have nuclear anymore. And they were concerned that the renewable energy supplies couldn't catch up. Um, so they realized, so they're going to cut down, cut, shut off nuclear and go back to coal because the renewable wind and solar production just aren't keeping pace with their demand. How is this a rational, well thought out energy policy? The answer is it isn't. And that's the problem. So many things are so politicized now that they're making these decisions and it there's no real We used to have distribution planning. We used to have integrated resource planning functions in electric utilities, at least in the United States, where they would actually plan carefully for developing new power plants. And then on the flip side, Finland just actually turned on a nuclear power plant. So clearly these, these, and I know Finland's the newest member of the EU, but they just actually turned on a nuclear power plant because they want to rely on nuclear energy for their own energy security and stability. And they um, actually are going to have the first new reactor in more than 15 years. And it's going to be help Finland achieve carbon neutrality by cutting its, by increasing its targets. So obviously Finland and Germany are completely on different ends of the spectrum. And then we have Czechoslovakia with way too much sun in the summer to know what to do with. Um, But isn't it wonderful? I love the world of energy. So thanks so much for watching the KJ show on the Bull Brave TV network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio.
And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And today we're talking about EVs as they are a shock to the system, as it becomes more clear that electric vehicles clearly are not going to be the immediate answer that people all thought they were. In fact, there's an awful lot more confusion that's going on and an awful lot more of customer pushback. So Joe Biden and his infrastructure no, I'm sorry, Inflation Reduction Act actually um, included tax credits for electric vehicles, which sounds great. In fact, the tax credit said that you had to have your parts manufactured in the United States as a way to sort of get that evil Chinese tie with the lithium battery mining that's happening and China controls the mines and then, then they make in Africa and then they make the electric, they make the electric batteries or electric vehicles in parts in uh, China using you know bad labor practices. So this was Biden's attempt at trying to sort of reduce Chinese um, made parts and put them into US vehicles. However, um, this is again something that's not really been well thought out and the automakers are actually concerned because with the new regulations that that Biden just passed, they're actually worried about they're tightening the standards so much they may be not even be practical to build the electric vehicles under these new conditions. And of course, the oil industry and the ethanol industry are, are really r worried so much that they now just have started a lawsuit. And of course, some, some Republican-led states are also saying that the EPA is overstepping and are not really allowed to make these sweeping regulations unilaterally. Um, so there's an awful lot of roadblocks to the adoption of EVs. And even if that doesn't, you know, even if that happens, there's still concern about what they should do about electricity, uh, electrical powered vehicles. In fact, um, the JD, there's uh, actually one of the biggest problems is that even though automakers are pouring more than $100 billion into the transition, they're saying it's going too fast and that the goals for electric vehicle adoption are falling far short of what the administration wanted to have. And, you know, how can you steamroll is what they're saying. The EPA is steamrolling it. But the other problem is that customers are starting to push back too. Americans are not buying EVs at the rate and pace in which they were hoping they would. In fact, part of it is because they're really confused. They're, they're not concerned, they're confused about whether or not the, where their batteries are gonna be made are gonna qualify for tax credits. There's also a reluctance to invest because there's no supply, no, no infrastructure of charging stations. And there's also supply chains that are lingering problems. So one, the vehicles take a long time to make and there are supply chain issues. And two, there's really no set infrastructure of charging stations. Um, last year, a study was conducted by researchers at the University of California in Berkeley, hardly a right-wing organization. And they discovered in Berkeley, which I assume has a fairly high inst installation rate of EVs, that their climate advisory group called Cool the Earth discovered, they tested every single fast track, track charging station in the San Francisco Bay Area. And you know what they found? More than a quarter of them, 657, they only have 657 charging points, didn't work. Either they were broken, they didn't pass the two minute charging test, charging cable wouldn't reach them, it wasn't functioning, other times the payment systems wouldn't work, and sometimes the screen was broken. So the network was down. So here we have a city that is so heavily promoting EVs that they have charging stations all over it. But most of them, or at least a, a, up to a quarter of them, don't work. Why would you want to invest in that technology if you're not sure, confident, that you're going to be able to charge it when you need to? Range anxiety happens to be one of the biggest uh, drawbacks customers are concerned about. And, J and, and then J.D. Power uh, found that one in five EV owner owners have recently vi visited a station that they weren't able to charge. So one in five, 20% of EV drivers have gone to EV stations and they couldn't charge their car, which is a bad thing considering if, it's, if you need to go to the charging station, chances are you don't have a lot of excess reserves. Tesla has their own proprietary network that they are starting to open up to more other manufacturers, but it's not really going as fast as they'd like. Um, but also you only, most of those stations are only open to Tesla drivers, which are certainly the upper tier of the EV um, owners. And um, they probably won't even have Tesla stations open to regular uh, non-Tesla owners until 2024. And so the decentralized nature 
of American charging EV stations is a real, real road back. back. And the problem is, it's just like a patchwork quilt. The charging is managed by a lot of different companies. There's no centralization. There's private companies, public-private companies, utility, government. Sometimes there's cities. I was in France, and I saw that there was a city-owned electric VG EV charging station. I took a picture of it. It was pretty cute. Um, there's all these different ways, and that the typical EV driver may have to have diff eight different phone apps to access the way into which to charge his car or her car at each state at, at a station because there's eight different possibilities and they have to make sure that they have the right app to be able to pay for the electricity and hopefully the charger will work. So in US the public charging is also way behind the number of stations is way behind other countries. Um, S&P Global reported that China has a mil 1.2 million charging points. Europe has 40,000 and the US has 140,000. Now, last time I checked, I think we're pretty much bigger than Europe, and we have a significantly less, oh, we have 140,000, sorry. So Europe has 400,000 EV charging stations, and we have 140,000. How is that making sense? And Europe, you know, is a lot smaller, and frankly, they have much better electrified rail, too. I mean, you don't really technically even need a car in Europe. So uh, we're not at the mass market stage yet. Um, and if the infrastructure isn't there, it'll put a damper on everyone's plans, according to an expert in the EV industry who works for um, uh, EV magazine. So if he's the experts are saying we need help um, and the infrastructure isn't there, it's no wonder the customers are starting to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe I don't want to invest in this new electric vehicle that's supposed to get a, a tax credit, but might not actually get a tax credit. Um, just two in every 10 Americans, according to the J.D. Power Poll, are actually planning on buying EVs, and the number shifts to one in 10 among Republicans. Um, coast and charger availability are the two major range cost, and charger availability are the two reasons that they're not really buying these new cars. And the cost issue was supposed to be taken account for, and that was what the whole tax incentives were about. But the system is really off the rails. Apparently, because anyone who bought an electric powered car was supposed to get a $7,500 tax credit. That's what Joe Biden promised in its new Inflation Reduction Act. But because it has these regulations I was talking about, they only can get certain parts from the supply chain sh shortage and then has added complexities. And given that China dominates the market, this means that some of the cars that are made aren't going to be eligible for the tax credits. So the Inflation Reduction Act isn't really going to lower the cost of EVs. Isn't it wonderful how these things work? And the number one obstacle is price. So if Biden and the other EV manufacturers are trying really hard to encourage purchasing of EVs, these regulations and these consumer concerns, which are rightly so, and the lack of an infrastructure, are all valid reasons why customers aren't in a rush to go plug one in. All right. Well, this is the KJ Show. I'm on, on the Bold Brave TV network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and I'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? 
Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network's The KJ Show. And today I'm talking about EVs being a shock to the system. And last segment talked a little bit about the challenges and the roadblocks in EV adoption in the United States. It's not doing very much better in Europe, I must say. Um, so I found a few articles that really illustrate the concerns that various European Union countries are having with this mandated requirement to get rid of internal combustion engines by 2035 or 2040. Not surprisingly, uh, Volkswagen, which is obviously a car manufacturer, is actually wants to have a delay in applying for the new, quote, Euro 7 car emission standards because they think that the, they argue that it's too costly and it's impossible to meet at the speed in which it's being required. So they have a new set of regulations that are coming in that are supposed to reduce the emissions, but the car manufacturer like Volkswagen says, not so fast, we can't do it. And they said expecting the new norms will be implemented in July 25 would lead to production halt for other cars that make, um, make uh, other, other manufacturers, other models of Volkswagen. So they're basically saying, we can't do it. And Volkswagen has really always been touted, not necessarily is, but it's been touted as a sort of an environmental green you know, company. And so they're having problems. And then Germany, and it, Germany, the country, asked for more wiggle room on the combustion engine phase out, not just because of Volkswagen, but they've asked the European Union to propose rules that allow combustion ba engines that run on CO2 neutral fuels or e-fuels to be sold after 2035. So now they're admitting that they're not going to get to the all EV fossil fuel um, world that they're hoping to. And um, they're actually saying, hey, wait, we can't do it. And under the new law that the EU agreed to, 20, by 2035, car manufacturers would have to achieve a 100% cut in CO2 emissions from new cars sold, which would be impossible to sell new fossil fuel powers in 27 countries. However, the law is aimed at speeding Europe's shift, but Germany is seeking wiggle room for combustion engines that run on e-fuels because that are produced um, using electricity. So basically, Germany is saying, hey, yeah, that's a great goal. It's laudable. It's admirable, but we can't do it. And so they are proposing that maybe um, they should come forward with a proposal on how we could use e-fuels, which are combustion engines, which will run with climate neutral fuels, could be used. And Germany was convinced that um, battery electric vehicles are the way to go, but wanted to see other technologies too. We need hydrogen fuel cell technology and e-fuels, especially in heavy vehicles and truck transport. So it's not quite going as well as the European Union staff envisioned. And then the really tricky part is, and this is actually scarier than the promotion away from internal combustion engines, it's now going to cost um, the new e-fuels to even, if they even are approved, the e-fuels, it's going to cost the average customer in Europe 200 pounds, or I'm sorry, 200 euros to fill up their car. 200 euros, which is about 220 bucks. Uh, the European Chancellor said that, you know, not only are we pushing away from combustion engines, internal combustion engines, we're also pushing towards this new really expensive fuel and we can't get to EVs and it's going to cost more. So he said that cars may be powered with e-fuels are allowed to be out after the 2035 phase out. The high cost would mean only wealthy drivers can afford the fuel and pushing some drivers who purchase combustion engines certified running on e-fuels to circumvent the rules and buy fossil fuel instead. Uh, E-fuel petrol could cost 22.8 2 euros per liter, which is 50% more expensive than the regular petrol or fuel that they sell today. 
And it's also um, energy intensive production process and costs the average driver 2,300 pounds to fill up their car on a synthetic petrol. So here we have. Germany pushing, a European Union pushing for a switch to electrification, uh, switch for electric vehicles. Auto manufacturers saying we can't do it in the time frame. And Germany, it's all saying, well, maybe we can do synthetic fuels, but unfortunately they cost a lot of energy to generate too. And it's going to cost the average customer 200 euros more to fill up their tank, 50% increase. And I was in Europe, but I can tell you, it get, petrol, fossil fuel is expensive in Europe. But it's also the liter, so it's not nearly the same as a third of a gallon. So you spend an awful lot of money fueling your car. So I can understand the push towards electric vehicles, but it's not ready. So now they're wanting to ban combustion engines, right? Not so fast. Italy, it's not surprisingly, home of what? Uh, Fiat and Maserati and all those really cool Italian sports cars. They're saying that it's, they're rejecting the ideological ban on the, for the EU on combustion engines. So Italy is saying, absolutely no, we are not in favor of this ban. And after the negative vote, e Italy voted negatively on this ban, as did Sweden, decided to, well, we'll withdraw it from consideration. Um, we have woken up Europe with this no vote. We hope others will understand that this is the time for reason, certainly not resignation, according to the, uh, one of the transmission ministers in Italy. Italy's condition to say yes to the new measures to provide uh, to approve this ban would requires common sense alternatives to achieving the UL's environmental EU sustainability goal. We must not bind ourselves to a single technology. There must be a choice. So Italy is saying no way are we in favor of banning it. And that makes a lot of sense if I, for the Italians. I agree. I mean, the Italians do love their cars, right? Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, that the e-fuels are actually very expensive and only the wealthy will be able to afford it. Now, not only is Italy pushing back, but so is Poland. Polish prime minister says they will do anything to stop the EU combustion engine ban. So again, they're starting to get some pushback from Europe. The chancellor, they said Poland is the only EU country to openly oppose the ban on new cars with petrol and diesel from 2035. Um, the council approved the ban, approved the ban um, when they wanted the exception as demanded by Germany, but Poland voted against it all. Poland said, we don't even want the exception that Italy wants. We want to have the ban. They said the ban on sale of combustion cars after 2035 is unacceptable. We will do anything we can to protect Polish families from another pseudo green idea by rich countries and bureaucracies from Brussels. I love these. Uh, the prime minister also said the law and the Poland's green transition, it will, they're in, in the favor of it, but they're not in favor of the backstage negotiations that will end up that are against the will and interests of millions of Europeans, including Poles. And the ban would hit the budgets of Polish families and prevent millions of people from adequately using transportation and basically hurt their economy. So the Polish prime minister, who, and Poland is certainly not as wealthy as Germany or France, is actually saying, hey, wait a minute, this, this, this ban on internal combustion engines is going to create hardship on Polish families. We need to be concerned about that. No one else seems to be thinking about that. Italy's obviously concerned, but Poland is really taking, taking it up as a concern to preserve their own country's economic and financial independence. So the, the road to our EV adoption is hardly smooth. In fact, it's more like Rocky Road. Um, All righty. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Old Brave TV network. You're watching the KJ Show, and I'll be right back with the call-in segment. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation 
author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, uh, watching the Bold Brave TV network, and I'm so happy you could join us today. Today I'm talking about EVs as a shock to the system, and of course I'd love to hear you call in and make your own comments and voice your own opinions to whether or not um, what you think of these new policies that are being forced in Europe and in America. Um, but until we get a caller on the line, I wanted to sort of stay, first of all, it's 866-451-1451. Please Hello. call in. Hello, John. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, just enjoying the show. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you mentioned 200 dollars or 200 euros to fill a tank. How much does it currently cost to fill a tank in Europe? Say in well, France or, uh, yeah, I, UK? we were. We, I, that's actually a good question. I can actually answer that because we had rented um, two different cars when we were in Europe in France for two months basically the first the first car was um an electric hybrid car actually diesel hybrid it was an interesting car and it tossed about a hundred bucks to fill it and it had a really good range the second one was a stick shift that my husband hated driving and that still cost about 120 dollars to fill and we were driving all over corsica so um you know it was very expensive it was and remember a liter is only about a third of a gallon so if you think about, you know, if it's, if it's two, two, it was like, it was actually a gas shortage in France when we were there too. The gas uh, refin refinery workers in France, naturally, went on strike. So the biggest gas station chain in France was on strike, which we didn't know about until we were almost on fumes coming down from Normandy to back towards Paris. So <laughs> we had our own little adventures too, but it is you know, typically it was about 100 to $150 for us to fill up our tank in Europe uh, using liters, which is, you know, certainly much more expensive than it is in the United States. And these are with energy efficient hybrid cars, stick shifts. I mean, we were not driving, you know, tanks, but um, yeah, it's a really good point. Your the fuel in prices have always been expensive, more expensive in Europe. And when we filled up the tank for our boat, that we rented that was at least three or four hundred dollars um f extra few wow. extra surcharge yeah on top of if, on top of what I, we'd already paid so I we had, it, it, yeah if i ahead. had to pay that kind of money i would stop owning a car probably well yeah they can do that in europe you can't really do that in the united states though because europe has this terrific rail system and it's actually really affordable and it happens to be run mostly on electric certainly the trains in france are all electric and they go really fast and they're very and they're very frequent but we don't have that infrastructure we've never you know we never you know clearly our trains aren't running right i mean we have train wrecks right we we've never we've right. neglected the infrastructure of the trains uh railroads ever since the car makers came in and that's to our own detriment because you know that's why when we have a, a trucking shortage we have supply issues because we don't have the trains to pick it up so yeah i, I don't know why they've neglected the trains but um that's really, if you really want an electric solution, that's it. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank you for calling. Yeah, it was. it's expensive in Europe, driving a car and fueling a boat, I can tell you for sure. Um, but I also wanted to get back, thanks, John, for calling. I also wanted to get back to something really fun I found in my uh, show prep that apparently another unintended consequence and unintended problem that they're now finding is that in the United Kingdom, they have their car parks, you know, their parking lots, multi, multiple story parking lots. Well, apparently the parking lots that were built in the 1970s in England and UK aren't strong enough to support the weight of electric vehicles. 
and they could actually be at risk of collapsing as the electric vehicles have put pressure on aging infrastructure. Uh, car parking experts and engineers have reported that the growth of EV use in the UK could put more pressure on car park floors with structures uh, buckling. And they're so worried about the new ability of car parks to hold the vehicles that the guidance is being developed to raise the weight levels. And a structural engineer said, I don't want to be a too alarmist, but there's definitely the potential for some early car parks in poor condition to collapse. The EVs are so much heavier than they were when the cars manufactured in the 1960s and 70s. The current Tesla model weighs about 1,600 kilograms, which is, kilogram is two, that's like 4,000 pounds compared to 768 uh, kilograms for a Ford. So it's, you know, twice as heavy. Um, and I don't really know my math in Brit British math, kilograms versus pounds, but I can tell you that if it weighs twice as much, that's a problem. Another problem is that the Audi e-tron weighs 2,300 kilograms, which is about 5,000 pounds, compared to only 770 kilograms for another Volks Vauxhall Visa, Viva. And even the Nissan Leaf weighs 1,500 kilograms. So we're looking at the EVs weighing twice to three times as much as the cars manufactured using internal combustion engines. And the reason is, is the batteries are so heavy. And so um, that also increases the cost. So not only do we have to worry about finding a charging stations for your electric vehicles, because they have the same problem in England that they do in the United States, they just don't have the infrastructure in place for EV charging. So, you can't, so if it's hard enough to find a charging station. Now you can't even maybe find a place to safely park your car because it might cause the parking garage to collapse. And you know, that's just something else I'm sure no one ever thought about when they were pushing these big deals f forward. And the other thing is the infrastructure in general in Europe, certainly, and it's much better places, you know, it's much better shape in some places than in the United States. But at the, at the end of the day, our infrastructure across all of the developed world is, is getting older and we need new roads and we need new parking structures and we need new buildings, but they may not be ready for the demands of this electrified world that we're moving towards. Another thing that I found that related to our discussion on EVs today was that apparently if you have a scratched EV battery, the insurer may junk the whole car, which sort of defeats the entire purpose of having an electric vehicle. So for many electric vehicles, there's no way to repair or assess even slightly damaged battery packs after accidents. And I'd spoken in a previous episode of how electric ba battery weighs so much more. So if an electric vehicle is in an accident with the normal car, it's going to cause a lot more damage to the, to the normal car, to the combustion engine car, because they are not as heavy. So the electric vehicles will actually cause a lot more damage. And, and that's a problem too. So the, the thing is, the insurers are now saying that the battery packs are actually, if they're scratched, they can't repair them. And it took a lot of lithium and cobalt and rare earth minerals and child labor to make them. So you know where they're ending up? Scrapyards in Africa. Um, and a previously unreported and expensive gap in something that's here called the circular economy. This is something that Alice has sort of been creeping into the literature lately, this need for a circular economy where we're supposed to be able to recycle and reuse and do everything except that for apparently EV batteries don't fit into that very well. I always find it amusing for my friends who are big proponents of these environmental measures and they kind of conveniently ignore that EV batteries are environmentally damaging. So they're very expensive. Battery packs can cost up to tens of thousands of dollars and represent 50% of the price tag. But then if you have a scratch, they're going to get junked. Something tells me that this is not what was intended. And um, if it goes straight to the grinder, as someone said, um, has zero repairability, it's not a real good long-term fix. Uh, there's not a lot of repair shops around either. So the EV challenge continues. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. Um, you're watching the KJ Show, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? 
Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network, and we're talking today about um, EVs, a shock to the system. So I actually found sort of in the interest of consumer reports, because I do try to provide information that's helpful to folks. Um, I actually found in an article purchased by an automotive expert called, from a magazine called Car Vertical that the top eight electric cars you should avoid buying. So instead of you know, having the top eight EVs you should buy, which you'd think a car magazine would want to promote, they're actually warning you against the worst eight vehicles. Um, and, it's, and it's really interesting. And it's not just because they're EVs, but they actually have point out specific reasons why these EV cars probably aren't what you'd want to spend your money on or not particularly the investment that they were promised to be. The first one of the do not buy list is BMW 13 uh, i3. They were expecting, but apparently, even though BMW has a terrific driving experience, and I know this because my future son-in-law has, a, has an old BMW and he loves to drive it on the racetrack, but apparently it has a tiny, this electric version has a tiny battery and an inefficient motor. And so therefore it is sluggish acceleration and the range is ever only 100 miles. Now I know most people who drive BMWs, first of all, new ones can certainly afford to uh, drive them. They can buy them. They're very expensive. Um, but he said that they only have a range of 100 miles and 19% of the owners experience issues during the first year of ownership, um, according to a 2021 driver power satisfaction study. So these are car experts rating electric vehicles, and these ones don't come in very high. Um, another one is the Fiat 500e, which um, the uh, editor of this article said that you, this is a car that has, causes more problems than it's worth. It's praised for its funky and timeless design, but that doesn't make up for its shortcomings. The current model has a limited to a 24 kWh or a 2442 kWh battery, which is small, and it only provides 115 miles of range. Now, range anxiety is one of the biggest reasons Americans are hesitant to buy cars because we have the infrastructure problems. Americans generally travel more than 100 miles in their cars, especially when they go on trips. We are, after all, a fairly large country. Um, the earlier 500, Fiat 500 electric version um, was created only to meet the California zero emission mandates. And it was discontinued in 2020 because they couldn't sell them. So here was a car manufactured explicitly for the California, and that still wasn't enough of a demand to keep it in production, because obviously it's other shortcomings like its limited range. In California, you need a pretty good range too. Um, the another one that isn't very practical, according to this author Mario Bucellus um, from EV Car Vertical, is says that the Smart EQ42 is not practical. It has two advantages. Um, it's very small but it doesn't mostly make sense. You said it costs over $20,000, but you wouldn't take it out of the city because it can only do 81 miles on a charge. 
and the handling is awkward and there's no real room for luggage. So it's small and doesn't have a lot of space. Now, if you're going to take the car, so it's basically a commuter car. Um, certainly couldn't take it on a family vacation. The Tesla Model 10 is also getting some pushback, saying that starting around $100,000, I told you these cars are expensive, they're, they're only SUV. Um, however, owners complain about issues such as paint, trim, hardware, and power equipment. And the suspension, climate, electric, and vehicle systems frequently fail. This particular model has been recalled 11 times. Now, if I'm spending $100,000 on the top-of-the-line Tesla, I think I would not want it to have problems with paint, hardware, or power system, especially because an SUV is designed to go at go off road, right? That's all one of the allures of it. We have a soup, bunch of Subarus, and that's what the reason we bought it is because sometimes, you know, it gets slippery rain conditions or we like to go on trails. Um, so you can't take an SUV off road, and there are issues with paint, trim, hardware, power, suspension, climate, electric, and drive systems. I don't know what else is left in the car. But if it's been recalled 11 times, something tells me it's probably not working very effectively. And if I, would I spend $100,000 on a car that has all these mechanical issues? Um, clearly, the Tesla design for its SVU has, SUV has not been worked out very well, which is concerning to me as well. There's a couple more cars to avoid. There's the Nissan Leaf. Uh, which is one of the earliest cars on the market and, you know, was sort of the, one of the prototypes. I remember seeing the Leaf, but the technology is already outdated. And compared to the other electric cars, it has a low range. The charging time is not fast and you can't even get a good resale value. That's the other thing about these electric vehicles. There's not a really healthy resale market for electric vehicle cars. Um, there's not really a good secondary market. A Volkswagen e-Golf is also having problems. It's not on the cars you should avoid list. Uh, it's an amazing electric car with a comfortable ride and good handling, but it doesn't have the features that you would expect at the price range you have to pay for. The price is high, which makes it even less sensible to go for. Um, so even though it's a cool little car, it's you know it seems to have good 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 things. It's not competitive. It's it's too expensive compared to other cars at the same price tag. This is again car buying is all about you know there's not a lot of rationality in generally buying a car in the first place. But if, why would you pay more for something that doesn't have as many features? Because that's really what sells cars are the features. Um, and then there's the last two on the do not buy list were um, the Hyundai Iconic. This electric car has features in good range, but its price isn't worth it. Um, the car lacks unique styling of some of the other cars, electric cars, and it might be less practical for drivers to go because it doesn't have cargo space. Maybe I guess the electric vehicle car manufacturers are assuming you're not going to use it for long tri trips, so they don't even think about building in features like trunks and space for luggage and things, um, which would be sort of odd, too. And then the last one that was on the list of do not buy cars was the Chevy Bolt, Chevrolet Bolt. Josh Andrews, an auto and the electric vehicle expert with Just Answer, recommends staying away from the Bolt for a lot of reasons, including it feels cheap, even for the lower price point, and there hasn't, there's been so many safety recalls, it's beginning to scare away potential buyers. Additionally, it's being discontinued. So here we have eight electric vehicles that all have, a, they have different range of price tags, but they're all viewed into, by independent automotive experts as not good value. And they range from really inexpensive cars like the Chevy Bolt to the Tesla $100,000 know, $100, car. And with, with the problems are pretty much universal. They don't have good range. They don't have cargo space. They don't have the features that most American drivers want. And there's some safety concerns about whether or not they're going to, you know, charging correctly because unfortunately there have been unreported fuels, fires of batteries catching on fire and EVs. The fire departments don't know how to put them out. They just have to let them burn. So I can see why there's a pushback from consumers who we understand the internal combustion engine. There's a there's an infrastructure in place to repair it, to fuel it, to keep it on the road, and there's a robust secondary secondary used car market. None of those features exist for EVs, which makes them a very difficult technology to embrace wholeheartedly. And clearly, we need to think of some alternatives. Somebody needs to start thinking of alternatives. And so far, the alternatives don't look like they're going to work either. So I think as much as we'd like to think that EVs are the car of the future, not quite yet they aren't. Um, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. You've been watching The KJ Show. We'll be right back.
What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the KJ Show, aired on the Bold Brave TV Network. So glad you could join us today. Um, I always like to end my little shows with something fun. And in honor of Earth Day, I think Earth Day is this weekend, and, and then sadly about the cause that died in the methane fire. That was horrible. But guess what? I found out something else about methane. It's not as bad as you think. And, you know, I am a big nature lover. Um, so I found out that wetlands... Um, can actually release methane too and cause climate change. In other words, anything. So not all methane eruptions is done from cows, unfortunately, or sheep, but actually the wetlands can, it can release methane too, but somehow that doesn't seem to be as bothersome as cows. Um, North Carolina's wetlands, according to a recent study, has emits lots of climate warming methane gas, and it has a much bigger impact and carbon dioxide and global warming, about 25 times greater. So the pre, since pre-industrial times, this is important, since pre-industrial times, atmospheric methane has contributed a quarter of the climate warming effect. If it's pre-industrial, that would mean before man, maybe, or at least before the economy that they're blaming climate change on. Methane can be seen all across North Carolina because it's not boggy and wet in eastern parts of the state, and the, net, the wetlands in North Carolina emit between 30 and 40 percent, natural, I'm sorry, natural wetlands emit between 30 and 40 percent of global methane emissions. So nobody is talking about cutting down the, meth, the wetlands, right? We're talking about not eating meat and putting diapers and bibs on our cows and our sheep and feeding them different supplements in their food, but nobody's talking about getting rid of wetlands. Well, why? because the waterlogged soil in wetlands are ideal for producing methane and microbes as they digest organic microbes, but they're also good for the planet too. And the patterns and intensity of these emissions are increased as the planet warms. So we're gonna get, not be able to get rid of methane. In fact, it's going to increase. The global warming is driving greater wet methane emissions according to one of the deal, one of the experts who's studying this. But I haven't heard any any concerns about worrying about getting rid of wetlands. In fact, that was one of the reasons that it took so long for Joe Manchin to be able to finish building the coal plant he wanted in West Virginia is because there was some concern according to the EPA about damage to the wetlands. But apparently no one's factored in the fact that wetlands actually create methane emissions called the wet methane feed wetland methane feedback issue. Methane emissions are growing according to North Carolina's greenhouse gas inventory report, but they also provide many co-benefits that help us in many different ways. So guess what? 
but lands aren't bad after all. In fact, they're actually good for the planet. They help minimize flood mitigation, ecological enhancements. They're the only really learning how to maximize them. And they're actually making climate, they're actually climate resilient. Protecting and embracing this green infrastructure is really going to be important to creating resilient communities and maybe to handle other side effects of climate change. And so the overall conclusion is wetlands, even though they create methane, are actually their benefits outweigh their costs. And so despite increases in methane from and nitrous oxide, the higher magnitude of fluxes, overall wetlands are good. And the, and the research paper pub, published in the journal called Wetlands said, in the big picture, the production of methane by wetlands is a small price to pay for all the other benefits we bring to the table. So let me get this straight. We are supposed to get rid of our cows and our sheep and stop eating meat because they emit methane. And apparently natural wetlands emit 30 to 40 percent of global methane. That's actually more than what the cows and sheep do. But, but because wetlands are a part of the ecological infrastructure, and I dare I say the, um, the most critical part, of course, and of course, guess who loves to live in wetlands? My friends of beavers. So the point being that we need wetlands and maybe this whole worry about methane maybe isn't as bad as we thought if it's part of the natural process of the earth why do we worry about it so much and if we know that the benefits of a wetland outweigh its harm caused by methane are we maybe overstating the problem or oversimplifying it or maybe we're not worrying about something that really matters um this is what concerns me there's not well thought out solutions yet but we're working on it but I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV network. You've been watching the KJ Show. I hope you enjoyed it. And we won't have a show next week because I'm going to be at a DOE conference. But we'll return in two weeks. Have a great day. This has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on the KJ Show.